Well, it's a good question. Um, aortic stenosis, you know, it is a problem in the United States that represents about 50 to 60,000 open heart surgeries a year. Um, when a less invasive procedure became available in the form of a transfemoral or transapical aortic valve, um, it, I think that people became interested in who was not being treated. And probably at least uh, twice as many people are not being treated than are, than are being treated. And of those, 50% are not, not being treated because they're considered too high risk for open heart surgery. So um, the question really is, are those people uh, appropriate uh, for treatment at all? Are they um, in, a, um, in a stage in life or state of mind that uh, may preclude any sort of intervention? Or are they, are they just uh, very frail and otherwise um, uh, in pretty good shape mentally and, and deserve something if it is available and it's less invasive? Well, right now in the United States, uh, we have one valve available uh, for us in trial, and that's the Sapien valve from Edwards. It's a stainless steel stent uh, that holds a bovine pericardial valve, and we've just completed a randomized uh, controlled trial, which is multicenter, and uh, the sites are both in Canada and in the uh, United States. That's the only valve that's being studied uh, clinically at this point in the United States. Core valve, which uh, is, uh, has been recently acquired by Medtronic, uh, is in the pre-clinical uh, uh, trial planning stages. Um, as you know, um, both valves are available commercially in Europe and are being used um, to ver in various um, uh, frequencies in different countries in Europe. And some institutions strongly use Sapien valve, others use uh, the core valve. The difference between the two valves is significant. As I mentioned, the, the um, Sapien valve is stainless steel with bovine pericardial leaflets. The core valve is a nitinol stent, uh, which is self-expanding upon delivery, and the leaflets are made out of porcine pericardium. So they're, they're very different. The uh, sapien valve is, is, de is uh, actively deployed with a balloon inflation, and the core valve is passively employed, uh, deployed with, uh, uh, with the uh, nitinol stent, uh, you know, returning to its preformed construct. Well, there have been a number of trials uh, so far reported uh, going way back to um, 2004, the early experience in France uh, with Dr. Cribier um, in the original valve, which was stainless steel and equine pericardial valve. Um, the uh, first studies were done really in moribund patients, and uh, surprisingly enough, these patients that were clearly inoperable, uh, several of them survived and actually thrived after the procedure. And subsequently, in Europe, um, a series of trials, including Revive, Revive 2, Traverse, and Revival, uh, were performed. And these were prospective multicenter adjudicated studies, uh, initially feasibility and eventually uh, safety and efficacy trials, which led to the approval uh, in the CE mark in Europe. Uh, some of the interesting things that came out of those studies early on were that if you could avoid a vascular complication, complication, your mortality rate was reduced from 30% down to about 5.8%. So it was clear early on that a lot of the mortality was associated with getting the valve into position rather than uh, the, the deployment of the valve itself. Um, uh, once that was recognized and screening uh, was more active as a part of the workup, uh, the mortality rates came down dramatically with the transfemoral approach. Uh, the other interesting idea that's come out is that the transapical uh, approach, which is surgery directly over the apex of the heart, um, also early on um, and persistently has a higher mortality rate than the transfemoral. Uh, when, when this has been studied more carefully, it's been shown that those patients are at higher risk um, for just about anything because their inoperable transfemoral approach is due to a heavy atherosclerotic burden, and you would... Um, you would uh, you know, surmise that that might be a, a worse uh, risk population, and now that's been shown to be true with both uh, retrospective and prospective analysis. So overall, the transapical patients uh, seem to have a higher mortality rate early on. It's getting closer and closer. It's only a few percent difference at this point. But interestingly, their survival rate at six months and one year is lower than the transfemoral patients as well, um, predominantly dying of, um, of uh, atherosclerotic disease or other comorbidities. Early on, the, uh, the technique was a, an antegrade procedure where the system was delivered through the femoral vein into the heart, across the uh, septum, into um, the left side of the heart, and then 
around uh, the side of the mitral valve and out the aortic valve. So it was a very complicated course. And uh, one of the big problems was um, that the valve could get entangled with the mitral valve uh, when it was being um, when it was traversing the left side of the heart, and when it was deployed, in some cases, could actually permanently injure the mitral valve, creating a like, catastrophic change in hemodynamics, uh, to say the least. So, um, it was it was um, proposed early on that perhaps a retrograde approach would be superior. Uh, John Webb in in Vancouver was the first to perform those. Um, retrograde procedures, and there was a dramatic improvement um, in the uh, acute uh, results of the, of the valve delivery. So um, all the systems that you're seeing now, whether it be Sapien from Edwards or Core Valve or the uh, dozens of others that are in development, are predominantly uh, transfemoral and retrograde approach across the aortic valve. Well, yeah, the valves are, uh, have different uh, properties in terms of the delivery. The uh, core valve and other uh, uh, deploying valves that are nitinol based uh, are partially retrievable or fully retrievable in many cases. And that's the attractive uh, nature of the core valve is that you can partially deploy and then resheath the valve and adjust it. And uh, in the case of the Sapien valve, which is an actively deployed stainless steel stent, uh, once it's deployed, uh, the valve is not going to be moved and there's no partial deployment and adjustment uh, per se. The um, both valves, however, can have another valve placed inside of it, and there's been an experience for both, in particular the Sapien valve from Edwards, where the, uh, if the valve is too low or too high, one can deliver another valve and anchor it between the uh, native aorta or aortic valve and into the first uh, stent place. So there are bailout situations that, um, that are available, um, even though you can't actually retrieve the valve acutely. I mean, ideally, clearly a valve that can be partially deployed, fully deployed, can be resheathed or retrieved and, and then adjusted is ideal, but we're, you know, we're, we're a few generations behind that in terms of product development. There's a there's a significant concern about whether these valves um, have a leak around them or perivalvular leak, and uh, as you can imagine, the aortic valve aortic stenosis has a lot of calcification in each of the leaflets and also in the annulus. So. If you deploy a cylinder, a cylinder, which is the shape of the stent, into a space that doesn't have a perfectly cylindrical um, uh, topography, that there will be uh, spaces around the outside of the valve. Um, and in fact, in most cases, at least with the Sapien valve, which is uh, where our experience has been, uh, there are some perivalvular leaks, which in general are traced to mild. Uh, early on, I think that there was uh, some greater problems with perivalvular leak and whether that was has been cleared up because of better sizing or uh, patient selection it's it's a little bit unclear at this point but there is um, there is a significant uh, percentage of patients that have some perivalvular leak uh, it, it appears in the follow-up uh, from the European trials um, because the data from the US trials is not available to us that that uh, that leak is very well tolerated and the very small percentage of patients that have moderate or worse um, perivalvular leak uh, may have some clinical uh, repercussions um, late, but these have been very, very few in number. And so probably trading a moderate amount of, a of aortic regurgitation for uh, uh, instead of having critical aortic stenosis uh, is, is a positive trade-off, and that's likely why uh, this is well tolerated. Clearly, uh, you know, uh, down the road we like to have a valve that, that perfectly fits um, into the annulus, and uh, there is no perivalvular leak, but uh, right now um, we're living with a, what seems to be a tolerable, tolerable degree of uh, perivalvular aortic regurgitation.